Hello again. Uh, this is Module 6B, part of the uh, marketing modules. Here's our objectives for this module. We'll, we'll be talking about uh, sales using personal sales force, telemarketing, various kinds of channels of distribution, the other channels of distribution rather than wholesalers and retailers. Uh, then we'll move over into promotion, the fourth P of the marketing mix, and talk about public relations and advertising. And lastly we'll talk about personal selling, not so much with a personal sales force, but the fact that somebody probably you as the entrepreneur has, has to be the chief salesman or salesperson for the company. A personal sales force is sometimes the best way to sell your product. However, it is the most expensive. You have dedicated people who uh, are out there selling your product, pushing your product, uh, they expect a salary, many of them expect commission, uh, benefits. It's uh, an expensive proposition, but you have the most control. You can tell them when, where, and how to do their job. Drug companies need a personal sales force. Why? Well, because that sales rep has to have accurate information, you know, and present a reliable professional image to the doctor, whether it's in a doctor's office or at a hospital. But uh, even that is changing. All right, and when I talk about advertising a little later, I'll talk about things constantly changing and, and the, the tools and approaches. But even here, we're seeing drug companies reducing the number of direct sales reps uh, that they have out there. Why? Well, partially because of the pressure, cost pressure, and pricing pressure brought on by generics, but also because of the fact that uh, they're not getting enough face-to-face -face time with the doctors. The HMOs and other medical plans are putting the squeeze on the doctors to see more patients in a given amount of time and be more productive. So the doctors have very little time to see these drug company sales reps when they come to visit. I know my doctor uh, says, hey, you've got from 8 to 8.30 in the morning or from 12.30 to 1 o'clock while I'm eating my sandwich uh, at my desk, uh, but that's all there is. So what are the drug companies doing? Uh, one, they're putting more information on their websites because the doctors are becoming uh, more computer savvy and go to the websites to get the latest information when they need it. And they are also advertising directly to the consumer. If you can't get mind share from the doctor, you put ads to the public, out to the public and say, you need this drug. This drug may be for you. And of course, what do they always say? Ask your doctor if this is right for you. Well, what they're doing is they're putting pressure on the doctor to make sure the doctor knows because you're going to go in and you say, hey, I saw the ads for this particular drug. Do you think that would help me with my condition? And certainly you don't want the doctor to say, never heard of the drug, don't know anything about it, uh, didn't see the ad. That's not an acceptable answer. Equipment manufacturers uh, use personal sales force. Uh, think of companies like Caterpillar uh, and other, you know, people, uh, guys selling locomotives to railroads or things like that or, or high tech equipment to industry. Again, need lots of knowledge, need a tight coupling with the manufacturer. Again, Salesforce can be, can, can be good and one approach 
uh, to dealing with a uh, personal sales force from a entrepreneurial standpoint is you can possibly uh, share some. You can go to a professional sales organization. You can outsource your selling and have independent reps uh, dealing for your company. Small contractors in the defense industry typically do that where one rep, one sales independent rep will actually handle two or three different companies that are not in competition with, with each other. They're in kind of different areas, maybe this is with the same customer base, but one sells uh, instruments, another sells uh, consulting services, and the third sells uh, perhaps whatever, something else. Uh, if it's military, it could be uh, weapons, ammunition, something like that or other kinds of services. So you can buy essentially a third of a person or 25 percent of a person. Of course one of the issues there is uh, trying to make sure that you're getting your money's worth, that that person really is spending uh, a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy uh, on promoting your company and your product. So personal selling uh, personal sales force doesn't have to mean dedicated people. Well, another approach is uh, telemarketing, and we're all familiar with telemarketing, I'm sure. Uh, it's got some advantages. Some people, uh, some customers pr prefer telemarketing <clears throat> rather than face-to-face. -face. They're uncomfortable with a salesperson being in front of them being, you know, pushy. It's a little bit easier to deal with that salesperson uh, over the telephone. Uh, sometimes just because you can hang up, you know. It's uh, hard to, uh, if you have somebody in your kitchen selling you something, uh, throwing them out the door may be not uh, an easy task, but uh, telephone you can always hang up. Unfortunately, We've all been called at supper time, even on when you're on the uh, do not call list, and uh, it can be a very monotonous job for the person doing it. Therefore, they uh, they may or may not have the bubbly effervescence that uh, you're looking for to promote your product. And of course, many many companies uh, have gotten a bad image just because of this uh, telemarketing. Are you interested in replacement windows for your home? You know, those kinds of phone calls, uh, particularly pre-recorded ones. So again, you have to use some common sense. <clears throat> Direct mail catalogs, still very effective. There are people who have prophesied that uh, mail, direct mail catalogs were going to go the way of the dinosaur because of the web. I don't think so. Uh, the statistics show that uh, consumer catalogs are more popular than ever and if you get as many as I do, man that's for sure, uh, every day there's at least uh, three or four in, in the mail. Very, very effective. Uh, good cost if you can do a high volume. And of course you can buy targeted mailing lists from magazines, from newspapers, there are all kinds of sources. You tell uh, a good marketing company <clears throat> what your customer looks like, who your target customer is, what's their profile, and you know, age group and demographics and all those kinds of things that we talked about. And uh, they will give you a list. Even in terms of geographics, you know, geography, uh, geographic regions and that, you can have it local or nationwide or even worldwide. You can buy any kind of list you want. And, but of course the downside is quantity one of a catalog is very expensive. And again, uh, most of them wind up in the junk mail pile without being looked at. I happen to be one of those crazy people who like to read catalogs or at least 
leaf through them while I'm watching television. And I frequently find stuff that I'd like to buy. But uh, you know, it can be effective. Well, what about the web? How about using your website to do everything for you? Well, I personally believe that that's not the answer. Uh, maybe in some case, some extreme cases it might be, but it's really going to be part of everybody's kit, just like the fax machine. Years ago, only high-powered offices, uh, professionals and that, uh, big companies had fax machines. Now everybody's got a fax machine. You get faxes from your local uh, sandwich shop or uh, little re nearby restaurant <clears throat> giving the specials of today for today for lunch uh, and you can fax back the order so that it gets uh, doesn't get lost in the translation rather than giving it to somebody over the phone again the fax machine is is everywhere so a website is going to be everywhere these days if you don't have a website you have a problem it's no longer a discriminator it could replace mailed catalogs, but I really don't think so. I think you're really going to want a combination. We'll talk more about that in advertising. Don't forget that you need bricks and mortar uh, to deliver your product. Uh, Amazon, big portion of their revenue is involved in bricks and mortar and people getting the stuff to the customer. Toys R Us a few years ago found that to be a problem. They went online. What they didn't realize was that uh, they had to get the toys to the people and they didn't work with their stores so their stores weren't interested in doing it and uh, they failed in getting a lot of toys to a lot of people before Christmas and wound up not only giving them their money back but also reimbursing them or giving them coupons, discounts uh, for you know for other products to, to make up for it. An effective way of doing that uh, that is if, if you do have a uh, a bricks and mortar component to your business uh, is to put the e-commerce portion the web ordering as an integral part of a, a in, of an integrated operation for example Walmart is uh, this Christmas uh, has been advertising it's a delivery to the store you go and you find it online the particular thing and I'm thinking of an ad that had uh, some uh, automobiles for kids you know the pedal cars or electric cars that uh, kids ride in, little kids ride in, and uh, what you do is you pick it out and order it online, have it shipped to the store, and can pick it up at your local Walmart. Uh, J.C. Penney's has been doing that for quite a few years now, where you can either have it shipped to your house for an extra charge, or uh, without paying shipping, uh, can have it shipped to the store and you pick it up at your local J.C. Penney store. So again, a, a part of a multi-channel strategy. For the little guy uh, who may not have stores or who can't tie in with a store, again, there's no reason you couldn't use Walmart or J.C. Penney as a vehicle to get your product, presuming you that they're the retailer who's uh, working with you, uh, that you couldn't have your product delivered to their store. Uh, one way that's effective for real little companies uh, is at a trade show, to show it at a trade show or a flea market or a craft fair and have people try it. Here I'm thinking of things like food products, uh, again the salad dressings, the uh, dip the stuff to make various kinds of uh, dip for potato chips. I'm sure you've seen that at flea markets or, or craft shows. Uh, jellies, marmalades, 
buy a jar at the show and continue buying via the website. Clothing is effectively done that way. Again, you have a nice selection at the show and if you don't have it in the color or uh, the color or the size that the customer wants, you say, here, here's, here's our card, here's our website, order it on the website, you know, and we have it back at the warehouse and we'll, you know, get it right out to you. So it does work. As part of your business plan, you're going to be looking at uh, the marketing plan, sections E and F, and here's the kinds of things, and we've just talked about that. We've talked about the market, uh, market analysis, industry analysis, who your competition is, port is five factors, uh, those kinds of, of things. Uh, pricing we've covered, we just talked about distribution, we will talk about promotion in a moment. And you have to put together some forecasts, how you're going to handle your marketing plan, how you're going to control it, uh, make sure that people are doing their jobs. And if you use statistics, particularly up in the, uh, up here in the industry or uh, market analysis, industry analysis, that area, make sure that you cite any statistics that uh, you quote, you know, that uh, the market for this stuff is growing at 20% per year. Says who? Okay. Put an ad, put a footnote down at the bottom uh, citing where that came from. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, you should look at is, the su in, is in the supplemental reading, it's called e-tailing. Again, uh, shopping online that we just talked about. Uh, an interesting article uh, that uh, talks about, you know, not only the big guys, but the little companies and uh, somehow, you know, in the search engines and how they can help you uh, help people find you, which is the important part. Okay, let's take a look at the fourth P. Again, product, price, place. The fourth P is promotion. How do you promote your product? How do you get people to know about it? How do you get people to want it? All right. One way is advertising. The key to advertising is that it is paid. It costs you money. It is not aimed at an individual. Typically we are looking at mass media. Although what the definition of mass media these days is is a, a little bit of a, a problem because we are segmenting the market down and going after niche markets as we will see in a few slides. You can use sales promotion to promote your product. Uh, coupons, contests, buy two, buy one get one free kind of thing. You got to tie it to your advertising so that people know about it. Otherwise, your coupons and your contests may be uh, not well known and therefore not used much. Publicity, public relations unpaid, not paid for, at least directly. Um, we're going to talk about that and, and what do you do? And lastly, personal selling, either you or personal sales force. Uh, again, that's one way of finding out about it. <coughs> again, one of the concerns is, again, don't go off and think that uh, just because you're going to put up a website that, uh, you know, people are going to find your product. Too many websites out there, too many similar products, even if you do a Google search, probably going to come up with lots of choices, uh, may not know what to ask for. And certainly if uh, your product is a niche product or, or an impulse buy product, Impulse buy, 
think uh, holiday decorations, whatever the holiday may be, 4th of July, uh, Christmas, uh, Halloween. Uh, a lot of times, if you don't see it in a catalog or in a newspaper ad, uh, you're not even going to be looking for it. You know, you're just going to say something and say, wow, that's neat, I think we should have that. That's impulse buying. Costco, BJ's, relies a lot on impulse buying. Let's first look at uh, public relations. Again, maintain or establish a company's image with the public. It is not paid for. That's the difference. Advertising is paid for. PR or public relations is not, at least not directly. Sure, you're going to have to put in effort and maybe even some money into doing, into writing things or getting other people to write things. If you have a restaurant, maybe you want a press release. Maybe you want an article written about you in the newspaper. Uh, if you're a service business, maybe you want to give a, a free seminar. Blogging, if that's your thing, although blogging has uh, been overdone quite a bit. So, you know, some, some uh, professionals find blogging to be effective in getting new clients. And of course you got civic, social, community involvement. What is that? Well, again, free seminars. Uh, you know, if you're an accountant, maybe you uh, uh, do some free tax work for, you know, senior citizens, things like that. Uh, maybe uh, if you are a, an investment uh, person or running a, an investment firm of some sort or real estate firm, you give some sort of seminar. Maybe it's as simple as sponsoring a little league team or sponsoring a soccer team. Having your company's name on their t-shirts. Having your banner with your tagline and your logo on the fence. Maybe you donate, if you're a restaurant, maybe you donate some free food uh, to maybe the, the soccer tournament. Maybe you put up a, a, a cook tent and either have low cost or even free hot dogs and uh, you know hamburgers or something like that you know as an advertisement for the restaurant Outback sponsors things like that it works get your name out there it's not directly paid advertising it's for the good of the community but it helps build an image <clears throat> well let's specifically take a look at, at advertising three kinds Informative uh, information ads for uh, drugs, medicines, those kinds of things. Educational, educating the public. Uh, persuasive Coke versus Pepsi, going for market share. And finally, you know, the reminder ads like Got Milk. Now, these days you can get cooperative ads. Uh, a co-op ad, think uh, cable TV, right? Ford or Toyota puts their ad, pays and has their ad done. Then at the very end, the local dealer inserts their piece. And of course, you split the cost. Again, it works. One of the things that uh, you have to look at is on the web 
if you're advertising using the web for advertising you've got push versus pull uh, another term is publish and subscribe the pull the push is of course the unsolicited we're getting away from the banner ads uh, but uh, you know there are pop-ups there again they can be annoying of course the poll uh, it's great for things like specifications part manuals stuff like that but do they know you will they try and find you if you're not looking for a new camera and at this moment you're probably not going to go to a Canon site, a Minolta site, whatever, uh, Nikon. So if you want to push your product, you may have to push it out there via some sort of unsolicited email to get people to come with you. And really, chances are you want to do a mix of both. In terms of media, there are lots of different advertising media out there. Of course, television used to be broad audience, very expensive to do a TV ad. Uh, radio was much more local. Uh, you could pick your audience much more selectively. Different, different target customers listen to different radio stations. So again, understanding what your customer looks like, what your customer listens to, what your customer reads uh, is important. Of course, you have to give a easy, simple to remember message, uh, you know, because you have low attention because usually you're driving at 60 miles an hour or more uh, while you're listening to the radio. And I love these radio ads where they give a telephone number. Yeah, I'm doing 70 miles an hour on the Garden State Parkway, and uh, I'm going to write down that phone number. Not likely. But things are changing. Cable TV ads. Uh, before cable TV, would a, could a, would a local restaurant advertise on a New York area television station? No. Why? Well, because the New York area TV station uh, covered New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And if your restaurant was in uh, Newark, New Jersey, uh, customers would probably not come from Connecticut or from Westchester or probably even from Manhattan uh, to your restaurant. So the expense of, of broadcasting this to uh, a, a large audience, most of that audience wasn't your target customer. You know, so it was a waste of money. Cable TV ads, you can be very, very selective on the geography that you get it uh, viewed in. So again, the local restaurant can target a local geography that is meaningful. On the other hand, radio stations are starting to consolidate and even though you're, you're seeing uh, local stations that really aren't local anymore, Disyndicated uh, with a satellite feed, but even there, the technology is such that they can insert uh, local ads just like the table cable TV companies do, uh, so that local companies uh, still get effective advertising on their local radio station. The important thing to remember is that the technology is constantly changing the rules or the paradigms. Remember the silly games thing, the paradigms. The paradigms are constantly changing. You have to keep up to date. Maybe you don't need an advertising company uh, and spend a lot of money for it, but uh, if not, then you have to be aware of what's going on and read, keep up to date uh, on things because what I'm telling you now, a couple of years from now is going, or even a year from now may be changed. Okay, other advertising media, moving right along. Magazines, good for uh, informative information type ads such as drugs. People read it, you can put a complex message. There are all different kinds of magazines, from everything from the broad magazines such as Time, uh, 
and Newsweek to little handyman and craft magazines. You go to the local, again, the 7-Eleven, you'll see magazines for almost any kind of interest, any kind of niche area. Problem is, is in that magazine, your ad has to jump out and, and catch the person's eye. Do you read the Sunday newspaper on Sunday? I'm lucky if I get through it by Wednesday or Thursday. It's good for sales promotions, but if the person doesn't, if your ad sale is only on Monday and that person sees your ad on Wednesday, uh, not only is it lost, but you may have a negative factor to worry about. Billboards. Billboards are considered old-fashioned in many senses, but uh, they're very, very effective. Uh, they can be very low cost renting space on a, a billboard. Radio stations put their ads on billboards. Why? Because people are driving by in automobiles, so they, you know, may turn to that radio station. Billboards are going high tech. Look at the supplemental reading, getting on board, talking about uh, high tech billboards. Go through the to the Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, via the helix and you'll see the high-tech billboards sitting above the helix. Go into New York, into Manhattan, you'll see high-tech billboards and even these just ads on the sides of build, building done in uh, you know this high-tech plastic. We talked about uh, catalogs, direct mail, yep very good flyers, you can use that uh, individual pieces of mailing to a mailing list can be expensive. Again, you can outsource that. There are services around who will do mass mailings for you at probably possibly cheaper than you can do it yourself. Mention internet ads. Again, push versus pull, reinforce the brand names. Again, sometimes a combination. Uh, example you have uh, a model railroad, I am a model railroader and I'll see an ad in the model railroader magazine and instead of a big ad showing a whole lot about the company's products maybe they'll take a fairly small ad show one hot product or or just uh, uh, an idea and tell you to go to their website give you the impetus to go to the website and find it maybe you send out a small catalog just a couple of pager for that doesn't cost much and again just with some teasing products and uh, get people to go to your website use combine the media combine the ideas well what kind of problems can you have there's a whole lot of information out there it's called clutter if you took a marketing course you should have heard the word clutter As new information mediums come in, things get tougher and tougher. Haven't even put some of the other things in there, like the 1920s with the radio, 1950s with the television. More and more advertising messages are out there. And compounded on that are more and more products. And sometimes you question, do we really need all of these different varieties? But they're there and everyone is vying for mind share. How do you put an ad together? Here's the steps, you can read them. And of course make sure that you got product on hand so that you can deliver it. Again the uh, you know, Toys R Us via the web scenario If, you, if your ad is successful, make sure that you can uh, fulfill the demand. All right, let's talk about selling. Selling is not marketing. Marketing is trying to determine what the customer wants and how to get the customer's attention. It's focused on the customer. Sales on, or selling on the other hand is trying to get rid of what the company has. 
It's focused on the company. Example. Computers, laptops. The marketing department is going to be concerned about the competition, the new laptop, the next kind of laptop, uh, you know, what does the marketplace need, what does the marketplace want. The sales organization, on the other hand, is concerned about the laptops that are sitting in the warehouse. What do we got in inventory and how do we get rid of it? Okay, different focuses. But somebody has to sell your product. Either you, your salespeople who work for you, again, either full-time or, or shared, or a retail sales clerk someplace. In addition, you have to sell yourself to your investors, lenders, and customers. You've got to learn to be comfortable doing selling. Get comfortable speaking to a group, giving a presentation, asking for an order. Make sure you know what your customer does. Don't ask, what does your company do? The worst thing you could do is walk into a business customer and say, I have the perfect solution for your copying needs. Uh, by the way, exactly what does your company produce? You ain't going to get that order, that's for sure. Make sure you do your research. Know who your customer is. Know the decision process. There are recommenders and there are decision makers. In larger companies, they're not the same people. You need to work both of them. Finally, ask for the order. Sales courses say, all right, uh, you ask the, I ask you, all right, we've come, you know, we've got a price, we've agreed on the price. Can I have the order? Well, you as the buyer don't say anything. The person who speaks first loses. If the salesman panics and says, oh, is there a problem? Uh, do you want something else? That opens up a whole new set of negotiations. You ask the question, can we place the order today? Wait for the answer. And if they come back and say no, say, all right, I understand that, but uh, what seems to be the concern? Uh, maybe you want to create some immediacy. Hey, we only have a limited supply of these things. Uh, you know, the holidays are coming up, and uh, this could be a problem. Uh, you need to sign today. Uh, prices are going up. You know, next month we're expecting a major price increase in our, our sources of materials, and uh, that could be a problem. If they object to it, address it and reposition it. Well, I understand. I understand your concern that this is a little higher uh, than you had, more costly than you had hoped, but understand you're getting a, a premium quality product here and this is going to last a long time. Sometimes the customer says, does it come in blue? Your response should be, do you really want it in blue? And chances are the answer is going to be, no, not really, I was just curious. You know, deal with it. One of the things you want is a, what in advertising they call a uh, unique selling proposition. How is your product better than the competition? It can be part of your tagline. Again, ah, this is what I was looking for earlier. FedEx, positively, absolutely overnight is the tagline that they're currently uh, using at uh, this point in time. One of the other things in the text uh, talks about is an elevator pitch. comes from the idea of that you are hanging around the elevators looking for a certain buyer, a certain executive, and you see that person getting onto the elevator, so you get on the elevator with them, and in the length of that elevator ride, you strike up a conversation, and you tell them who you are, what your company has, why the customer should buy it, and what many people forget is a follow-up offer. Hi, my name is Bob Zeese. I'm your uh, rep from Xerox Corporation. 
we have this great new color copier that will help your publications department and talking to some of your folks down there uh, about it. It could cut your copying costs by 30 percent and uh, produce extremely high quality documents. And as you're just about done when the person is just about getting off the elevator, you say, uh, here's my card. Uh, may, may I give you a call uh, and uh, come in and, and give you some more information about it, talk to you a little bit about it, give you some details? What is that executive going to say? They're probably not going to say no. I mean, people don't get to executive positions by having poor people skills. And they'll probably say, yeah, yeah, call my, call my secretary, uh, call my administrative assistant. Uh, yeah, maybe we can set something up. Do they mean it? Of course not. They just want to get rid of you. But what you do is next week you call up that secretary, that administrative assistant, and say, last week I met Mr. or Ms. So-and-so, and we talked briefly about our new Xerox color copier, and uh, he suggested that uh, I give a call to you and set up an appointment to come in and explain it in more detail. Are you bending the truth a little bit? Sure. Do you get the appointment? Sure. You need to do it. You got to be assertive. Another dimension of selling involves needs. And you should have seen, again, in a management course or a uh, uh, marketing course, Maslow's Pyramid. Question is. All right. What? What? Uh, and again, the concept of Maslow's pyramid, if you have forgotten it, is that it's a pyramid of five levels, going from physical up to self-actualization. And the idea is, is you cannot go to the next level up until you've satisfied the lower level, the food, shelter, uh, and sex uh, of the physical level, and then you go up to financial and job security. Uh, social is love and relationships, respect is image, status, power. Self-actualization, the best definition I've heard of that is that given all your pluses and minuses, you're happy that you're you. You don't wake up every morning saying, I wish I was somebody else. You're happy that you're you. Uh, Nobel founder of the Nobel Peace Prize. He invented dynamite. Well, the story is is that he, uh, in terms of self-actualization, uh, he woke up one morning and looked at the newspaper and read his obituary. Uh, his brother had died, but the newspapers picked it up that he had died. And basically it said he invented dynamite. And that was not what he wanted to be remembered for. It was important, made a lot of money for him, but it wasn't what he wanted to be happy about. So he started the foundation for the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, what does this mean to the small business? Well, you have to know where your customer is. What level are they at? You know, you have to make sure that your product and your advertising, your selling is responding to that right level, be it security, social, respect, or self-actualization. Can it change? Can a customer change from one level to the other? Sure, they can go up, as I said, as a particular level is met, but they can also go down. Katrina. The hurricane in Homestead, Florida, a number of years ago. Not a big market for BMWs and mutual funds right after Katrina or right after a, a hurricane of, in any place. We're back down at the uh, drinking water and plywood physical level. Maybe we're at the security level trying to protect what few belongings we have been able to uh, keep and, and have survived the calamity. So, you know, a lot of those businesses and uh, products that
were aimed at the higher levels went someplace else until the got, place got rebuilt. Take a look at the supplemental, supplemental article step by step uh, for the sales steps. Read it. You're going to have to do some selling. Another way to look at selling is in the reading that was for this week. Uh, towards the tail end, uh, different kinds of social styles. This is a course that uh, you'll see uh, it goes quite a ways. It's quite old, uh, but uh, has been around social selling sty styles and breaks your customer down into different kinds and shows examples as to how to deal with it. You know, is the person looking for recommendation? Are they looking for speeds and feeds? Are they looking, you know, are they, uh, do they want to be, feel comfortable and warm, you know, that uh, you got your company, your product is going to take care of them? You have to deal with different people in different ways. Now the concern, of course, is to meet your customers' expectations. If you run a landscaping business, you probably don't want to, and you're going out to meet a new potential client, be it commercial or, or uh, homeowner, you probably don't want to go in a three-piece suit and white shirt and tie and, and wingtip shoes. Uh, maybe you want to go in a uniform. Uh, logo shirt, logo cap, okay, clean, looking prosperous, looking like, uh, you know, you're a successful landscaping company. Maybe if you're dealing, if you're that same landscaper, but you're going for a loan to a bank or to an investor, maybe you do want to put on a suit and tie or at least a sport jacket and tie, look like a business person. Think of what your customer expects you to look like. Customer relationship management. We've dealt with that a little bit so far. It's fairly recent to uh, manufacturers, but not to, not to retailers. Uh, the retailers have long, the local stores have long tried to build a relationship with you, get to know your name. People buy from people, even on the web. Uh, responses to emails that are meaningful and prompt are important. You like dealing with that website because you know uh, that the service is good that you can get your questions answered. It all helps build your brand, your brand image. For the small, little business, again, me, perhaps even service business, uh, you want repeat, you want relationship marketing. You want repeat business or referrals. You want to get the service. You want to get the repairs. What do you do? Give out buyer cards, you know, like frequent flyer, and they call them frequent buyer cards. Uh, you know, when you buy 10 sandwiches, you get one free. Uh, customers should have a comfortable feeling doing business with you, that you know who they are. Here's the bottom line. Build lasting relationship with your, with your customers. Your best customers are important as ref referrals. Uh, also, they continue to buy from you. Share, give referrals to other people. They'll give them to you. Okay, if you're a, an accountant, link up with a lawyer. If you're a real estate agent, link up with perhaps a lawyer or a title company to get cross-referrals. 
Make sure your marketing is integrated. Make sure your logo, your tagline, your advertising, your PR all ties together. And make sure you say thank you to your customers so that you are better than your competition. All right, in uh, week seven, we're going to look at organization, uh, the wonderful world of taxes, which is a problem you can't get away from. Make sure you look at the supplemental readings and uh, the textbook. And uh, any material that's there for read for next week. All right?